You know, we took our girls uh, to Disney World uh, about seven and a half years ago. Now, Kara was 10, Keone was uh, eight. And one of the theme parks at Disney World Hollywood Studios. I don't know if you've ever been there, but Hollywood Studios. And one of the roller coasters there was called the Rock Roller Coaster. I don't know if you've ever ridden that ride. Now, we went out the girls, you know, 8 and 10, so we said, let's go try this ride out. And so they said, okay. And so we're in line, and they're getting kind of nervous, you know, because they hear the, the rattling and shaking. And we've, we've got another roller coaster, so they, 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 they know what it's like, but they felt a little scared about this one. So we asked one of the guys in the line, one of the workers there, is this a rough roller coaster? Is this a bad one? He goes, oh, no, it's nothing. Okay, okay, that's fine. So the girls felt a little bit better. So, you know, we're in line. We finally get into that thing. We get strapped in with these harnesses that really tighten us down there and stuff like that. I'm going, "Uh uh-oh. Then all of a sudden, this thing starts. The light turns green, and we accelerate super fast, like from zero to 60 in like negative five seconds, okay? It was so fast, all right? And after you accelerate, you do immediate loop-the-loop, and then you're going doing barrel rolls. You're going all over the place. I mean, it was crazy. And the girls immediately start screaming. And then they start crying, okay? And it was a little bit too much for them, uh, maybe way too much for them. Anyway, you know how they take a picture of you during the ride as you're going through it, and you can take it home as a keepsake? Well, uh, here's a picture that they took of us. (laughs) That's my favorite picture. (laughs) Sheer terror, sheer terror. (laughs) Look at her (laughs) face. I love it. Christine and I are having the time of our life, but I mean, I think this traumatized our girls, girls for life. Anyway, we're starting a new CERN series called An Emotional Roller Coaster. Okay? An Emotional Roller Coaster. It is basically a series on the various emotions uh, that we might experience uh, in life. You know, and life can be an emotional roller coaster. You have your highs of the highs, you have your lows of the lows, and you go anywhere in between, and you ride this wave. Uh, throughout your life. And um, we're going to take a look at a lot of these emotions that are depicted in the book of Psalms. I think for many of us, uh, we might have a hard time dealing with the emotions that we have, whether it be because of culture or because of our upbringing. Uh, Some people think, uh, and I used to think this way, that emotions are are bad, or we had a very negative view of emotions. Uh, Some think that, you know, we should ignore or deny our emotions because Certain emotions are really a sign of weakness, we would think. Or some emotions are, are too harsh. And actually, um, sometimes I think it's actually bad, or we used to think it's bad to cry, or it's bad, it's, it's actually a sin to be angry. That's how I used to think. Uh, and so as a result, uh, we can easily become emotionally challenged and have emotional damage because of that, all right, uh, in terms of knowing our emotions, okay? In fact, but we have to see that, that emotions are actually a good thing. God created us with emotions, and actually God has emotions. God has emotions. And we see God experiencing and expressing uh, and having the whole gamut of emotions that all of us experience. In fact, we see him or Jesus experiencing you know, all of them, and Jesus experiencing them too. And so God has created you and me to be, to be emotional beings. But it's really important for us to know How should we process them as we go through them? And the Psalms will give us really good pictures of how we should do that. How should we handle our emotions? How should we deal with them in a way that honors God? So to start us off this morning, we are going to take a look at emotions and worship. So let's all turn in your Bibles to Psalm 100. Psalm 100. Uh, We have Bibles if you don't have one. So if you don't have a Bible, uh, please raise your hand. The ushers We'll give you a Bible that you can borrow for today. We always have Bibles back there, and I encourage you all to bring a physical Bible so that you can look at that and look at the verse in context and not be distracted by all the dings and the uh, uh, the, the text that you get. Uh, we're on page 500 in the church Bible, and we're going to see that worship is meant to be a very emotional experience. Okay, it's a very emotional experience. All right, so let's take a look. Psalm 100, we read it. We're going to read it again. And it says... Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is God. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. 
So the first thing that we see here is that we need to engage your emotions in your worship. Just see the emotions. This is a call to worship. And just see the emotions that are expressed in this psalm. It says, shout joyful, or make a joyful noise in the, in to the Lord. And that literally says, shout to the Lord. Okay? Now, the word is a very emotional word in the original language. Okay? It's used to shout in all kinds of situations. It could be used as a shout of triumph. It could be used as a shout of distress. Um, so um, our, we had a volleyball tournament yesterday. Our, 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 we had a, a, a team that played in this uh, volleyball tournament uh, for churches uh, all over Chicagoland. And our church, uh, we, we did okay. Uh, our church had a team in Keone and I went to watch and support them along with several others. Okay? And it was a very emotional time for all of us as we watched this game, okay? When someone on our team made a great play, all right, there was a shout of triumph. Yeah, great hit, great block, way to go. But then we lost the point. There was a shout of distress. Man, you stink. No, no, we didn't say that, okay? But, you know, it's like, oh, no, like, what, oh, we missed it. We missed it. It went out or something like that, okay? But, man, I was very, very proud of our team, okay? Uh, we made the playoffs, but we lost in the first round, but they did really well. Um, but here in this passage, the, joy, the shout is a joyful shout, the shout of triumph. It says here, gladness, serve the Lord with gladness and gladness. This is a festive type of happiness, okay? When you're celebrating something special, okay? Think about graduation parties or, 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 or birthdays or a wedding. Everyone is happy. There's a sense of gladness for that. It says later on in verse 2, come before his presence with singing. And this is more than just singing a tune, okay? It's a very... Um, um, uh, it has this idea of shouting again. And again, it's a very emotional word in the original language, okay? There's an excitement. There's an enthusiasm. There's a very celebratory atmosphere that's being commanded here. It says later on, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Okay, true thanksgiving also uh, is, is, has that heartfelt sense of gratitude. Um, and it says also enter his courts with praise. Praise is enthusiastic compliments for, for who God is and what he has done. And it's different from thanksgiving, uh, which is recognition and gratitude for what the Lord has done for you personally, where praise is just complimenting God for who he is and what he's done. So from this psalm, we see that worship is meant to be a very emotional experience as we come before the Lord. So, so I want to ask us, you know, how has your heart been uh, in this worship service uh, as we uh, come before the Lord this morning? Uh, what did your heart feel as we sang these songs and as we prayed the prayers? Uh, was there real enthusiasm? Was there real joy and gladness and thanksgiving and praise in your heart? Or were you just here, you know, just going through the motions? Now, please don't fake it, okay? Uh, the last thing that God would want is for us to fake our emotions and our feelings toward him. You know, how would you like if everyone faked uh, the, the being excited about you? You know, we don't want that. But God knows your heart, okay? So, so, so you, you can't fake, you can't fake him out. So, so my encouragement to all of us um, is, is to allow these emotions to be felt and experienced in worship as we come before him each and every Sunday. Um, because when emotions aren't stirred, um, you know, ask the Lord to help you to really feel the truth of these things. You know, John Piper writes this in Desiring God. The engagement of the heart in worship is the coming alive of the feelings and emotions and affections of the heart. Where feelings for God are dead, worship is dead. Without the engagement of the heart, we really do not worship. So worship is not worship if we don't truly engage the heart. And so if it's felt here, Though no matter what you are doing physically, you are not worshiping the Lord, and he is not pleased. And Jesus said this to the Pharisees in Matthew 15, 7 to 9. He goes, you hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching his doctrines, the commandments of men. So even though they were worshiping with their mouths and singing or saying the right thing, their hearts were in the wrong place. And Jesus calls them hypocrites. So we really want to make sure we strive to worship with our heart. So again, did you feel anything? Do you feel anything when you come before the Lord to worship him? And not only should we engage our emotions as we worship, but, but I want us all to feel free 
to express your emotions as you worship. We are free to express them in stadiums, right? In football games, and softball fields, on golf courses, in our homes. But why not in worship? Why can't we freely express ourselves in worship? You know, again, yesterday's volleyball game, you know, great shot. Yeah, there's clapping. There's excitedness there. So we have permission here to lift your hands, to bow your heads, to close your eyes, to smile, to laugh, to even cry as you worship or to kneel. Allow your heart to be moved at worship. Then express that to the Lord. And for those of us who are Asian, you know, the, the culture teaches us to, to suppress our emotions, to control our emotions, especially in worship. So my friend says, you know, for us, we have two and a half foot worship. It's either sitting or standing. So it's about two and a half feet, right? That's the extent of our worship. And sometimes, you know, we tend to look down on those who are, are more emotional, uh, in their, in their, who are more expressive. I know I did when I was a lot younger, you know. Uh, I think when a person was raising their hands, you know, what a show-off. Or, or I'd think, you know, you're weak because you're emotional. And so I would kind of look down on people like that. But then there's a story in the Old Testament about King David in 2 Samuel. You know, King David was dancing and leaping before the Lord uh, in celebration and worship. And his wife, Michal, he, she despised his outward display of emotion and told him so. She says, you're making a fool of yourself. And David said, I'm willing to do this before the Lord, and I'm willing to become even more undignified in my worship for the Lord, to show my excitement and express my excitement to the Lord. And because she looked down on King David's lavish expression of emotion to the Lord, Michal, his wife, ended up becoming childless for the rest of her life. That's seen as a major curse back in the Old Testament. Because she looked down, on someone who was so expressive in his worship of God, she was cursed. So we can't judge other people for how they worship. But let's make sure we seek to engage our emotions in adoration and worship as we come before the Lord and feel free to express them. Again, try not to distract others and don't do it to show off and don't fake it, okay? But pray that the reality of God grows in you so much that you would be truly moved in your heart and be willing to express that the Lord. Because remember, true worship involves your heart. So put your heart into it. The second thing that's really important, though, is we need to make sure you base your emotions on the truth. You know, when I was, uh, you know, when I was in uh, eighth grade, I wanted to be on the basketball team, but I didn't make the basketball team. So uh, I wanted to be a basketball manager. So I just helped the basketball team out, uh, keeping stats and all that stuff. And so while I was doing that, I started getting these notes that were handwritten notes that my friend would give me. He was another basketball manager. He would give me these notes, and they were signed Cheerleader X. And these notes kept telling me how much she liked me. Okay? Cheerleader X. She wouldn't say her name. And so I asked my friend, who is this girl? I, I need to know. And I was really, really excited because, you know, all the cheerleaders are pretty cute. Okay? So, so um, I kept asking him, but he said he was sworn to secrecy. So, you know, for, for I don't know how long this went on, for maybe a couple of weeks, but it turns out that they were playing a joke on me. Okay, there was, the, the cheerleaders were actually writing the notes, but they were just goofing around, and he would give it to me and just to, 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 to I don't know, just to, to manipulate me and to, to, to give me emotional damage. Anyway, I got back at him because I beat him in the chess tournament, and I won the championship through that, but that's how I got back at him. But anyway, but I felt like a fool, okay, because I got excited for a lie. No one likes to fall for things, okay? No one likes to have others play with their emotions, right? So it's easy for us to be kind of guarded with our emotions. You want your emotions to be reacting to truth, not lies. So, you know, our worship of God is not just a purely emotional experience. It's an emotional response that's based on reality and truth, not wishful thinking. Okay, verse 3 in Psalm 100 says this, No! No, that's using your head. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Okay, so we are commanded to know some truths about God and to base your emotions upon these truths. So what are these truths? One, he is God. And the word for God carries with it being a ruler, being, being a judge, being a sovereign, being the supreme being. We sang about that. He is the only king forever. He is far above us. He is in total sovereign control. And because of that, he deserves to be worshipped and revered. 
There is no other. It says here that he made us. He is our creator. Without him, we would not be here. So, so we owe our very life to him and to him alone. This is meant to bring us a sense of dependence upon the Lord. Apart from the Lord, we are nothing. It says here that we belong to him. We are his. He owns us. We are the sheep of his pasture. You know, sheep are basically defenseless and completely dependent upon their shepherd. The shepherd protects. The shepherd provides for. The shepherd leads the sheep. Then verse 5, it says, For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. His faithfulness to all generations. God is not just a God over all mankind who's far away, but he's a very personal God, who not only cares about all people, but he cares about you personally. He knows your name. He knows everything that you do, and he cares deeply for you. You know, we sang earlier, there was another in the fire standing next to me. He's with us wherever we go, knowing and understanding all that we're going through. He is good to you. He loves you. He is faithful to you. The almighty God of this universe who keeps every star in his place cares about you. So these facts about God and our relationship with him should bring about a great sense of of, of dependence upon the Lord. I desperately need God. It should lead to a sense of appreciation and thanksgiving because he has been so gracious to us. Even more than giving us life and protection and provision and leadership, he's given us salvation. We know now what the psalmist didn't know about Jesus Christ, that although we were sinners who had offended a righteous and holy God who deserved nothing but God's wrath, that God loved us so much that he sent his only son to pay the penalty for our sins by dying on that cross. And God's wrath for your and my sin was inflicted upon Jesus during that crucifixion. And it was a terrible, painful death. And the wrath we deserved, Jesus took on. And the promise is that if we repent or turn from our sin and believe that Jesus died and rose from our sins, we'll be saved from God's wrath. We'll have forgiveness of our sins. We can have a relationship with God and we have eternal life. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ proves that truth. We can celebrate it because it's based upon fact. It's not wishful thinking, but Jesus proved it. And that's a victory really worth celebrating joyfully because we have a share in that victory, folks. We get eternal life through what Jesus has done for us. And that's why Jesus deserves our heartfelt, joyful praise because of the salvation he freely gives us. And do these thoughts cross your mind as you came and participated in worship? Again, it's easy to just come here, go through the motions, and not really engage your mind. Just singing the songs, because that's what we're all doing, and forgetting who we're singing to and all that he's done for us. So make sure you're thinking about the Lord when you come here on Sunday mornings for worship and seek to think about him throughout your day. And, you know, you might know all these things and still not feel these emotions. Why is that? It might be because God is really not that real to you. You grew up with all these facts, but it's not that real to you. He's more of a theory or he's more of a philosophy than a real person with whom you interact. And if he's not that real to you, that's okay. Don't don't feel bad, okay? Just be honest. And pray that the reality of God would just grow in your heart that you would experience him in very real ways throughout the week. So that when you come to church, you could say, man, I want to worship God because I saw him work in and through me this past week. Or because I realized something about him where I'm just growing more and more in love with him. So pray for that to happen. And for those of us who do experience these emotions during worship, it's a good question to ask from time to time. If your emotions are more based on whether you like the song, whether it's a hype song, or it's because of who God is and what he has done for you. I mean, I admit it. You know, some songs really do it for me, okay? I really love these songs. Some songs don't, right? And I have my favorites. But remember, worship is really for God. It's not for me. And think about what the song says to God or about God. And strive to please him by singing it sincerely from the heart. Even if the song doesn't do it for you, just say, man, but this, 
this is really to please God. And I really want to do that from the heart. Okay? So engage your emotions in your worship. Base your emotions on the truth. Third, make sure you prepare your hearts for worship. Verse 2 says, serve the Lord with gladness. Uh, the word for serve means to labor or to work. Okay? So in other words, worship is not meant to be a passive kind of thing. Okay? A lot of times we have this mentality <clears throat> that, that worship is a performance that the people up here are doing for all of you. And, and you know, the worship team, the preacher, the congregational prayer leader, the MC, uh, they're the performers, and, and you're just passively watching. But, but no, no, no. It, it's not meant to be passive. Worship is meant to be active for each and every one of us. You are not to be entertained. You are not the audience. God is the audience, okay? And we are all performers here. It's all about God. It's all for him. We are here to actively work for him in worship to please him in worship. And that means we do our best and we give our best to the Lord. And that requires preparation. Okay, verse 4 says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. So the gates led to the courts of the temple and the courts were outside the temple. Okay, so we're not talking about what goes on inside the church, okay? Uh, we're, we're talking about what goes on as you're heading towards the church, okay? It means preparation, all right? Although our worship service here starts at 1030 in the mornings on Sundays, I encourage you to prepare your hearts ahead of time before you even get here. I always say good worship begins on Saturday night by getting a good night's rest, all right? So maybe, you know, maybe lay off the video games or the Snapchatting or Instagramming or hanging out or Netflix binging. Stop that at a decent hour on Saturday night so that you can get some sleep. And then as you're driving to church, as you're coming to church, think about who God is. Think about how you've experienced him or saw him this past week. Think about what he's done for you and how you experienced him. And then just think about that. And then come to church a little early so that you can prepare your hearts to meet with the Lord as a congregation. Now we try to finish our sound check by 1020. We did it at 1021 today. It was my fault. Okay, but 1020 so that you can come in here uh, and you can just spend some time in meditation for the Lord. Just to think about, prepare your heart for worship. Maybe read through a psalm. Maybe read through a passage. Maybe confess your sins or, or just pray and meditate. But just prepare your heart for meeting with the Lord. And for me, coming early revolutionized my worship experience because my heart was prepared to worship God. Okay, then lastly, not just prepare your hearts, but then worship the Lord with all your heart. As we sing the songs, strive to express your heart to the Lord. Hopefully the words that we sing, they're our expression of your heart. And if not, you can still sing them with the attitude of, Lord, I'm not there yet, but I really want these words to someday soon be a true expression of my heart. As you go through the announcements, you'll get excited about how God is working in our midst and how can I worship the Lord by being a part of what he is doing in our church. Then as we pray the congregational prayer together, express your dependence upon the Lord, desiring God to work powerfully in our midst and in the lives of the people in our church family. And as we receive the offering, express your love, your thanksgiving, and your dependence upon the Lord. And then as we listen to the sermon, we have to understand, make sure we understand the purpose of the sermon during a worship service, okay? It's easy to think that the centerpiece of the worship service is a sermon. Okay, I used to think that all the time. And the singing and the announcements beforehand is really just filler or things to do before we get to the meat of the service, which is a sermon. We have to do those things so the latecomers don't miss a sermon. That's how, we, that's how I used to think. And people oftentimes think, you know, I can miss the singing and I can miss the, the, the announcements, but I need to be here for the sermon. And once the sermon is over, I can leave. Okay, a lot of people think that way. Uh, I don't think that happens here. I don't really observe it that much, but I've seen a lot of churches where as soon as a sermon is done, the pastor says, let's close in prayer, a lot of people go up and they leave. Or then, or then the worship leader comes, let's all stand for the last song, people stand and a lot of people leave, okay? Um, that's not what it is. Okay? We need to realize that the worship service is not sermon-centered, but it's worship-centered of which the sermon is a part. So then what is the purpose of the sermon during a worship service? Well, in our English congregation here, the purpose of the sermon is to inspire all of us to live a life of worship throughout the week. To inspire you and me to live a life of worship 
throughout the week. Okay? So it's not really education. It's not really meant to be teaching, although that's a part of it. Uh, but it's really to inspire us to live a life of worship throughout the week. And too often our thinking, though, is, what do I get out of the sermon? Okay? Was it entertaining? Or was, it, was it interesting? Was it funny? Did, did, did I learn something? Now, now, we do our best to, to, to make our sermons do that, but really, that's not the focus. So as you listen to the sermon, the focus should be, Lord, I love you, and I really want to please you and worship you with my life every day. So please show me how I can do that as I listen to the preaching of your word. That's the attitude I hope that we can have. Um, and you know something? God can do that, and he can speak to you personally through a boring sermon, through a monotone sermon, through a funny sermon, through an interesting sermon, or even a great sermon when your heart is open. Okay, so let's really strive to have that attitude as you go through the sermon. Okay, so I'll give you another chance. Seven and a half years ago, you went to Disney World. Oh, just kidding. I'm not starting over again. Um, let's strive to honor and strive to worship God by doing our best to listen with open hearts, opening our hearts to the Lord, yearning to live a life of worship throughout the week. You see, worship is meant to be a, a giving experience. We give honor. We give glory, praise, adoration, and thanksgiving to God. And as I said before, it's a heartfelt response to who God is and what he has done for you and for me. So let's make sure every Sunday we gather together that we strive to give him our best when we come to worship him and that we worship him with all our hearts. Okay, let's bow for a moment. What is God saying to you this morning as we read this psalm and went through this psalm? of worship to the Lord. Has your heart been involved? Have you engaged your heart in your worship of him? Or have you just been going through the motions or just engaging your mind? So evaluate yourself these next moments. Offer your heart to the Lord and say, Lord, I want to give this to you. I want every worship experience to be something that fully engages my heart. That there would be that sense of joy and excitement and praise and thanksgiving and gladness. Even if I'm going through tough stuff, Lord, to realize how great and awesome you are and what you have done for me. That I could worship you from the bottom of my heart. Just say that to the Lord this morning. God, you are our God. You have made us. You, we are yours. We are your people. We are the sheep of your pasture. You are good. Your steadfast love towards each and every one of us endures forever. And you are faithful to us. Lord, forgive us if we have not realized the greatness of your love and your grace towards us and how awesome and powerful you are. Lord, I pray that as we grow in our relationship with you, that this would really touch our hearts in a powerful way. So that not only would we worship you from the hearts here on Sunday mornings, but that we would truly live a life of worship throughout the week, seeking to honor and please you in everything we do. And we pray these things in Jesus' name.